Gaming to me is the purest form of art. Is it a painting hanging in a gallery? Well, games have beautiful artwork that captures the imagination, but games are more than just 2D. Is it a movie? Well, games contain beautifully written stories of which we can alter the outcome, yet gaming is more than just 3D. Is it a symphony? Well, gaming contains stunning orchestral harmonies that steal our hearts, and yet gaming is more than just audio. Gaming is all of these art forms combined and more. It holds a very special place close to my heart, on this channel, I have done and will continue to make videos on gaming's beauty as there's so much to appreciate. However, there is an ugly side to gaming that I need to address. See, gaming in general has gone on to be more successful than any other median. The film industry is worth $77 billion, music $28 billion. Gaming is worth more than double both of those two combined at $250 billion. Gaming has evolved from simple Pong-like games of the 70s to massive open world games with lifelike graphics. The growth has been substantial, and like any industry that's successful, the vultures will circle looking for a way to pick the carcass clean. Years ago, games were simple. You paid $40 for a game and that was it, you got the game. The game that you purchased was what it was. Nowadays, with the introduction of the internet, the landscape has changed. With the ability to download things immediately, games have received some of the best DLCs like Witcher Free's Blood and Wine or Elden Ring's Shadow of the Earth Tree. However, we've also been introduced to loot boxes, microtransactions, memberships and season passes. This is, when used incorrectly, what leads to what I call the ugly side of gaming. In today's video, I will cover each of these parts and their impact on the gaming industry and its customers. A quick side note, thank you for taking the time to watch this video, I hope you enjoy it. If you do end up enjoying the video, please consider leaving a like, and if you love gaming, please consider subscribing. I'm Av Gaming, and I'd love to get your feedback on the topics that we cover. Anyway, back to the video. So let's start with microtransactions. As I said, back in the day, a game came as it was. You would buy your game, and that was it. In 2006, Bethesda released the giant open world Oblivion. The game released two expansions later on, but this had been around for a while. For a price of less than a full game, you could add additional content to your game, and for the most part, it was worth it. The first microtransaction sold by a major publisher was in 2006, when Bethesda sold horse armor in Oblivion for $2.50. It was made as an experiment to test the market's reaction to this type of DLC. Now, most players reacted negatively, claiming that $2.50 for an in-game cosmetic item was too much. But, despite the negativity, the horse armor became the ninth best-selling DLC in Oblivion and was still being purchased more than two years after its release. Bethesda and other game studios began using microtransactions more as an extra stream of revenue. And then in 2008, the iOS store launched on Apple iPhones, and games there used microtransactions as the main source of funding. In the first three years after its launch, iOS apps made over $3.6 billion in revenue with over 15 billion downloads, and 80% of that revenue came from mobile games. In an attempt to capture the success of microtransactions in mobile games, developers have added more microtransactions in PC and console games as well. Over time, microtransactions have become not just the norm, but we fully expect them. Nowadays, they're peppered in every mobile game, most regular games, and especially in online gaming. No longer would you buy your horse armor just for you and your own viewing, but now you get to get it and show it off to others in the game as well. Sort of like how some people buy designer clothes and sports cars to show off their success in real life. Not that I'd know what that feels like. But this allowed people to do that in the online gaming world. Microtransactions are mainly split into three categories. Cosmetic, like the horse armor. In-game currency. And then boosts or power-ups. Now these boosts can be temporary or permanent and offer some advantages to players during gameplay. These boosts may include like new weapons, pets, horse armor, speedy points gains, more powers, enhanced abilities, or faster progression. So, pay to win. 
So the positive aspect is that games can get continuous updates, but there's a lot of negative aspects too. In some games, players can gain an edge by in-game purchases of powerful items or upgrades. This creates an imbalance between paying and non-paying users, which can lead to frustration and a sense of unfairness, undermining the overall gameplay experience. They're also incredibly addictive. Microtransactions are small and easy in-game purchases, which can create addictive behavior among players. These transactions, once done repeatedly and frequently, can become impulsive spending habits, putting significant financial burdens on vulnerable individuals. Without discipline, this can quickly lead to someone spending too much money on a game, meaning they're unable to make other payments on things they actually need. The way the games advertise them too, special sales, buy now and get a better deal. Pay just one dollar more and you get the extra thing. It's all designed to suck the player into paying. If someone is susceptible to these kind of marketing tricks, it can literally end up ruining their life. Huge in the mobile gaming world, gacha games can quickly drain someone's bank account. It's crazy that there aren't more regulations. This is one of gaming's uglier sides. The second ugly aspect is a form of microtransaction, a loot box. So I'm going to tell you about a game that I used to love. See, I'm a massive football fan. I first played FIFA in 2003 and I loved it as it was the only football game with licensed teams. I bought the next edition in 2004 and it was an entirely different game on a new engine with upgrades. 2005 was the same and so on and so on. Each installment made major advancements on the prior and the offline career mode was my favorite. Each year they added new features and it improved with each one they made. And then in 2008, FIFA introduced something called FIFA Ultimate Team. It was an online version, but instead of buying players with in-game currency, you could buy packs of cards with real money. These cards would be random, but you'd get a selection of players in each one, from anything from the best players in the game to the worst players in the game. Naturally, the more packs you bought, the more chance you had of getting better players, which gave you an advantage in the online games against other opponents. After the success in sales from the 2008 FIFA Ultimate Team, FIFA stopped progressing overall. Every installment looked identical to the previous entry. The career mode barely changed at all, and even today, the career mode and other offline game modes haven't received an update since 2017, seven years ago. Do you know which part of the game did receive updates? That's right, FIFA Ultimate Team. Money talks. If you go to a slot machine in a casino and you keep pouring money in, the thrill of when you land something and it lights up and you win, that's all designed by choice. It triggers dopamine in the player's brain, which creates a rush of pleasure. It makes you come back for more. Just one more spin. One more pack of cards. This gambling has led to many parents fighting their children because of the amount of money they spend on these games. These card packs are also known as loot boxes and are in a lot of games, especially in mobile gaming. Loot boxes are a virtual container which can be purchased by using real money in a video game which contains random rewards in it. Loot boxes are criticized for their gambling type of nature due to the chance based setup. Critics of the loot box controversy argue that the uncertain and randomized nature of loot boxes can create an experience that's similar to gambling, especially when real money is involved. Loot boxes can also make players spend more money in search of powerful rewards to gain a competitive advantage over other players. This can lead to an increased financial burden on those same players. There's been a lot of upset reaction to these things, and rightly so. At the end of the day, gambling is incredibly addictive to some people, and it's ruined many people's lives. What makes me upset is that these people didn't go to the casino. The casino came to them. And I know a lot of people will say, well, they don't have to click on it, they don't have to buy it, but these companies have gotten the pattern down. They know when to have a pop-up when to push, how to get a tiny purchase from the user and then slowly increase that over time. It's all set up to sucker the player in and it's one of the ugliest additions that's entered the video game world. The next ugly side of gaming is the battle pass or rewards pass. 
In the video game industry, a battle pass or rewards track is a type of monetization approach that provides additional content for a game, usually through a tiered system, rewarding the player with in-game items for playing the game and completing specific challenges. Players that are already playing the game can get rewards for lower prices. The idea of a battle pass is that you can get rewards by spending less money compared to in-app purchases, but the trade-off is that you, as the player, have to play the game constantly in order to get those rewards. So it rewards players for continuously logging in and playing the game and then punishes them for missing out. It creates a need to show up just to get the rewards. Not only does this have a negative impact financially on the player, but it can also take up much of their time, taking them away from real life responsibilities. I understand that some games have gotten this right, but I do feel it is again designed to control and take advantage of the user, especially if they're young. Another thing we see a lot of is copycat games, Call of Duty imitations, free to play hero shooters online battle royales. Concord tried to copy Fortnite and it shut down after just two weeks. So many games are trying to copy the Fortnite model despite the game already existing, but why? With publishers always trying to hit a home run and become the next Fortnite or the next Call of Duty, we end up with a saturated market for the same type of games. Lawbreakers, Concord, Overwatch 2, Deadlock, Marvel Rivals, Apex Legends, Valorant, they're all so similar, but they keep flushing these games out. Rather than innovating and creating something unique, we get the same type of game coming out despite nobody really asking for it. Concord flopped as it was a poorer, more expensive replica of an online hero shooter game. We have too many. Nobody asks for more. We don't need more, but they keep coming out. So why would publishers greenlight and spend millions on these projects, but not make something unique? Well, money. Fortnite has made $26 billion in sales so far, and publishers don't really care about making the gamers happy. They want that sweet cash. They want to be the next big online game and cash in via microtransactions. But what they don't realize is that we've already got those games. They can't be Fortnite because there's already a Fortnite. Replica copycat games is another huge problem within the gaming industry. So Sims 4 has 16 expansions, each over $20. But why? Well, money. FIFA now focuses only on the loot boxes. But why? Well, money. And who's asking for these things? The investors. And therein lies the main ugly thing in gaming. See, the cost to make a game nowadays is millions. It takes years to make a good game, and the staff have got to get paid. People like myself and most gamers, we don't have that kind of money to pump into these type of ideas and projects. Gaming studios have to either find funding themselves or go through a publisher. Publishers have investors and stockholders, and as such, they have to pick and choose which games to get behind. The most creative games are coming from those outside of the AAA production houses because publishers don't like taking chances. They want surefire hits, so they can keep their stockholders happy. Games like Kingdom Come Deliverance was one of the most unique games made recently. In January of 2014, the studio who made the game, Warhorse Studios, launched a crowdfunding campaign via Kickstarter. This allowed them to make the game how they wanted without having to obey the publisher's demands and that game sold over 6 million copies. Without crowdfunding, this game would never have been made. A publisher would never have taken that gamble. Publishers need to see a return on their investment to please their stockholders and so they stick to what they know to work. They copy what's already hot. They encourage microtransactions, battle passes, loot boxes, whatever they can in order to make as much money back as possible. I mean, it makes sense, and at the end of the day, I get it, they are running a business, but what ends up happening is that we get such bland, watered-down games from AAA studios that come and go. Companies like Ubisoft pump out game after game with the exact same formula as the previous entry, tons of microtransactions and guaranteed to have many DLCs. These games have become boring and repetitive. 
They feel soulless, like there's no love, passion or art involved. It's safe riding, there's no risks. They're just doing what they have to do in order to get the product out. The recent Star Wars Outlaws is a good example. It scored pretty poorly everywhere and the main complaint was the same as every Ubisoft game. It's bland, it's safe, copy and paste. Take Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Origins or Odyssey and they were almost identical. No risks were taken. The reason is because if they tried to do something different and take a risk, they wouldn't have got the funding from the publisher. They want their money back and unfortunately they have to follow what they ask for. Same game formula, many DLCs, microtransactions, loot boxes and battle passes. It's proven to work. It wasn't always like this as studios didn't need as much money as games didn't need as much work. Now they do, and that's why so many of our beloved games have underdelivered and gone for the money making tactics. What's ironic is that nowadays indie developers like Warhorse Studios or Lorien Studios have become the old AAA studios of the past. They release games that take risks, provide quality work and put microtransactions on the back burner. As a result, the reviews score high and they're usually better than the AAA studios work. Why? Because you can feel the love. You can feel the art involved. They make their games for the passion of gaming, for the fans. They don't need to make fortunes or milk their fans and instead they focus on making the best product possible. Kingdom Come Deliverance, Baldur's Gate 3, these games show that the art is still there in gaming, but it's mainly in the hands of the indie developers now. So this is the ugly side of gaming. Money has become a key feature in game development and games that used to take thousands to develop 20 years ago now take millions to make. As a result, many studios go to publishers to get funding and once they go there, creativity is discouraged, money making practices encouraged and the games flushed out in bulk. This is the ugly side of gaming and an unfortunate necessity. However, there is always a light within the darkness. Warhorse Studios made Kingdom Come Deliverance with a sequel arriving next year. Lorien Studios made Baldur's Gate 3, which won Game of the Year last year. There are so many studios who still make great games without using these tactics that I've discussed and there always will be. There will always be another game that shines, you just have to weed through the crap and protect yourself from the traps. This is the dark side of gaming but as shown by Elden Ring and Baldur's Gate 3 winning the last two Game of the Year awards, they can push the money making games on us, but the art will always win. The fans, when asked to vote, will always choose a quality game made with passion over the sterile corporate games. Anyway, that's it for this one, but what do you guys think? Do you agree with my points, or do you disagree entirely? Do you have a story to share about your experience? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like. And if you're new here, please consider subscribing. I'm Av Gaming, where we do video game analysis, identifying what makes great games great and what could make good games great as well. Thanks for watching. Av out.